Today I'm going to talk about a pendulum system that includes moment of inertia. So far, all the systems I did on my channel were somewhat idealized, right? They looked at point point masses and based on those we saw what the various results were. In this case, I'm going to look at moments of inertia and I'm not going to assume that there are point masses. I'm going to assume that masses have real sizes. Okay, and that makes it much more realistic. So what I did is I took Thor's hammer, in this case, as you can see in this picture over here, and I'm going to let Thor's hammer swing back and forth. Okay, and I'm going to see what the, the equations of motions are based on the Lagrangians. And I'm also going to look at simplifying this and getting to this result, and then I'm going to simulate those two and then I'm going to see what the differences are and what the effects are of all these estimations and approximations. Okay? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the generalized coordinates. And if you see here, it's swinging back and forth in a plane. And what that means is that there is only one generalized variable, which is theta. Okay? And I'm going to use, obviously, I'm going to use the Lagrangians like I usually do. So theta is the generalized variable and as a consequence the delta theta uh, for the infinitesimal uh, variation is uh, obviously delta theta, okay? So that's number one. Generalized forces are not present here. So I only have gravity in this picture and there are no external forces probing on the system. So all the generalized forces are zero, okay? So now we're going to determine the Lagrangian, and we always do that in two steps. We're looking at the kinetic energy first, and then we're looking at the potential energy. We subtract those, and that will give you the Lagrangian. Okay? And based on that, you can calculate the equations of motion. So now we need to look at the kinetic energy of Thor's hammer. And we're going to split it up in two pieces. There's one big piece over here the head, and there's one second piece, the shaft, right? The head is has a mass of m1, and the shaft has a mass of m2 with a length l, okay? So the kinetic energy of the head here is essentially a half i1 times theta dot squared, where i1 is the... Uh, moment of inertia, okay? How do we calculate this moment of inertia? I did it in the following way. You can do it in a different way also, which I'm not going uh, to get into, but I did it in the following way using the parallel axis theorem. So the moment of inertia of a big mass, in this case a head, with width w and height h, is 1 12th m1 times w squared plus h squared. And you can look this up in a big list, right? There's a big list of all kinds of moments of inertia uh, with various shapes. You can also calculate it, but usually you look it up in a table. So that's what I did. So I looked it up and I got to this result. That is when this, the moment of inertia is this value, if it's going around its center of mass. This is the center of mass. If it's rotating around the center of mass, this is the moment of inertia. Just this piece. Okay? Now we use the parallel axis theorem because it's not rotating around the center of mass, it's rotating around this point, right? Because it's a, a pendulum and it's going back and forth like that. So it's rotating around that point. And as a consequence, you need to use the parallel axis theorem and you have to add an extra m1, mass of these, the head, times the length between this point where you mount it and the real center of mass here. And that is L plus H over 2, right? This is H and H over 2 is the center of mass of this head, okay? So you get L plus H over 2 squared times M1. And you have to add that in because it's not rotating around the center of mass but it's rotating around this point, okay? And you do the same for the shaft. So if you look at the formula for the shaft, you see that usually, if you look it up in a list, it's a 12, 1 12th M2 times L squared. 
L is the length of the shaft, M2 is the mass of the shaft, and this is what it is, right? You can calculate it, there's a formula for it, uh, but you can also look it up, what I did. And now again you have to use the parallel axis theorem, because this is the moment of inertia if it rotates around the center of mass, which is here at L over 2, right? If this shaft rotates around that, you just get this term, but now because of the parallel axis theorem and because it is rotating around this point, you have to shift it by L over 2, and that's what I did here. So you can add that in, and then you can add them up and see that it is one third M2 L squared. And you can actually see that it is correct. If you go to Wikipedia, you see also a shaft that is rotating around a point, and that is exactly this. Okay. So these are the kinetic terms. Now we go to the potential term, V. How do you calculate that? In order to do that, you have to first add up the two masses over here, and you have to find the center of mass for the whole system. And I drew it in here. The center of mass is very close to the center of mass of this heavy head here. Usually the shaft is much lighter as the head, so the center of mass of the whole system is very close in this case to the center of mass of just the head. Okay, So I drew it here, just to give you an idea. And what you do is you use the formula over here, which is the sum, 1 over the sum of the masses, which is m1 and m2 in this case, right? I replicated that over here, times mi ri, and ri are all the center of masses. So the center of mass of the head is here, the center of mass of this shaft is L over 2, right? That's over there. So you see that, that I filled that out over here. So the, the center of mass for the head here is L plus H over 2, of course, from this point taken, right? Times M1 plus L over 2 times M2 for the shaft, divided by M1 plus M2, and that gives you the center of mass of the whole system. And that's what you need when you calculate the potential energy. Because now you have to uh, calculate the potential energy with m, which is m total in this case, times g, times rt, which is the r that we just calculated, times cosine theta. Okay, And that gives you the potential energy change if it goes up and down. Yeah, It's the projection essentially of this whole system onto this axis. And that, because the, the angle is theta, you get a cosine theta over here. So if you work that out, you get this equation, right? If you fill this into here, you work it out, you get this, right? The M1 plus M2 falls because this is at the top and this is at the bottom, so that's convenient. So this is what you get for the potential energy. And now the Lagrangian for the whole system is T minus V, which is these two terms over here, times theta dot squared, times a half, right? Minus this term, so you get a plus here, g times that term times that term, cosine. So that's your Lagrangian. So now we have an ability to calculate the equation of motion based on the Lagrangian over here. And we're going to use Euler-Lagrange equation for that. And this is the equation we're going to use. That's the Euler-Lagrange equation. There are no generalized forces, as we stated before and derived before. So that one is zero, and there's only one generalized variable, and that's theta. Okay, so we're going to use this equation here. Once you fill that out, it looks ominous, but it's quite simple, right? Because you have one theta dot with a constant in front, and there's a cosine theta here with a constant in front. So it's not that hard. So if you differentiate the Lagrangian with respect to theta dot, you get this piece, right? And if you then differentiate it once more with respect to t, you get the theta double dot out, okay? Now you need to differentiate with respect to theta, and that's for the second term, and you have to subtract that. So you subtract that, the derivative of cosine is minus sine, so you get minus minus, which gives you a plus, times g, times this constant over here, times the sine, and that equals zero. So this is the equation of motion of Thor's hammer in its full generality, right? We did not do any approximations, except for the fact that we assumed that, that this is really square and that that's not necessarily the case, but 
uh, that will not give much of a difference if you actually start simulating it. So this is the first equation that we're going to simulate. And this is the one in full generality. And we will see what the deviations are from this if you do approximations and if you use big angles instead of small angles. So let's first assume that there's a small angle. So that means that sine theta will be theta. And when you fill that out, you get this linear second order differential equation that you can analytically solve. Yeah. This time I decided to just simulate this one, this one, and this one, which even has more uh, estimations or approximations. What we assumed here is that the mass of two, which is the shaft, is very small compared to the mass of the, the head over here. That's what, what I assumed here, okay? I also assumed that the width and the height of the head are much smaller than the length of the shaft, which is usually the case also, or in many cases, okay? When you do that, and you work that out, and you fill that out in this equation, you essentially get this one. And this one should be very familiar to you. This is just a linear differential equation of the second order of a pendulum, of this pendulum, with a mass that does not have any size, right? A point mass. So if you take a point mass, you take the approximation that sine theta is about theta, you get this equation out of your uh, Lagrangian, if you would do that, okay? So now the idea is to have these three equations, do simulations on all these three, this one, this one, and this one, for various angles. First I'm going to do small angles and see what the difference is between the three. And then I'm going to do big angles and then I will see what the difference is between the three. Okay? And that's what I did here. So I took small angles on the left. So this, these are small angle variations. And these are big angle variations, right? I used 0.1 radians for the left hand side, which is a small angle. And I used 0.4 radians for the right hand side, which is a very big angle. And when you look carefully, it's, you see the following. At the top, I simulated up to 10 seconds. And then, because you couldn't see the difference, I simulated between 90 and 100 seconds. So I simulated 100 seconds here, also here. Simulated 100 seconds on the left and on the right. The top graphs show between 0 and 10 seconds, and the bottom graph between 90 and 100 seconds. And that's the same here, okay? So even for the big angles, the top is between 0 and 10 seconds, the bottom between 90 and 100 seconds. So you can see what the difference is after some time. And what you see in the top here, this function here, this is the, uh, this is the fully approximated one. This is just a G over L equation, okay? That's what you see here. And you see that that frequency is higher than the frequency of the other two solutions. The other two solutions, you only see one because they are so close together. So if you have a small angle, there's no difference between Thor's hammer and the fully nonlinear uh, differential equation that you solve. It's exactly the same in, in its uh, results, right? If you simulate much longer, you see that there is a difference here, right? And you see that Thor's hammer's frequency is a little bit higher than the nonlinear version, okay? You can also see that the uh, fully approximated version has a much higher frequency and that's because you don't take care of the moment of inertia that makes it slower. Okay, so these, these clocks are running a little bit faster. If you would make a clock out of it, you will uh, notice that that clock runs faster. Thun's, Thor's hammer runs a little bit slower and then the fully uh, non-linear version runs even more slower and you can see that over here, right? With small angles, it's not so prominent, but with big angles on the right hand side, you see that it is very prominent, right? There's huge differences, even between the first 10 seconds, you can already see that this version runs much faster, right? That's, that's the one that's fully approximated. It's just a G over L. And even the, the Thor one runs a little bit faster already than the one that takes care of nonlinearity issues also. And it's very prominent if you look between 90 and 100 seconds. You see a huge difference over here. Okay? I think this is a great place to stop. If you like this video, please subscribe and please like. And I'll see you in the next one.